we're about to start our session. It's called Digital Empathy, the story of data, narrative, and engagement. And if you're joining us for your first session, you can learn more about the Data Economics Festival by heading over to lydian.com slash festival. That's L-Y-D-I-O-N.com festival. We can find all kinds of interesting information related to the 20 plus panels and sessions on how digital data and economics are intersecting, as well as a schedule of live and recorded events that the team put together, such as a mixology, mixology class, uh, a virtual golf clinic, and, and even a live sing-along. And both of those things are right after this, by the way. If you feel like singing, it, it's your day. Um, the team's excited to bring together these topics to such a broad audience, and we'd love to hear feedback on other topics in data economics that people are interested in uh, as we begin the early, pla early planning stages for the next festival. And again, my name is Rob McGray, and this is Digital Empathy, the story of data, narrative, and engagement. So to me, it feels like every day this world, or at least mine, is getting more and more programmatic and as the tools and devices that we use to aid us in our lives become more and more advanced, it feels a little more each day that in addition to helping, they're, they're starting to guide us. It feels kind of, well, like a game. I had this conversation yesterday with a friend about my car. And um, these days, I intentionally give Tesla access to the data that I collect in my car because I want that product to evolve. I want it to get better, this product, a car. Getting better benefits my experience. It benefits me. And it benefits the others who own and choose to share their data, and even those who don't. Driving this Tesla more than anything I do, in anything else I do in my actual life, it feels like a game. The entire experience has an element of gamification that includes rules, skill building, as well as incremental advancements that make the game better over time. And at least for me, it feels infinite and, and it never really gets old. And this is what data sharing is providing me. And this part of my life in particular feels very guided by data. And now maybe we could say the same thing um, for, for things like say Facebook and the way they gather data. But in this particular case of Tesla, we're talking about data on weather, traffic, my particular driving skills, um, you know, the device itself, the car. And, and, and as I'm interacting with the car and sharing all this data and having this really great experience, the car is becoming more and more familiar with me. And the same can be said for maybe my phone, my watch. And you know what? I'm, I'm starting to feel like less and less I'm in control or excuse the pun, I'm driving this experience. And I wonder if this is how it happens. Like a, a great video game where we think we're in control and the game wasn't really thought out by a bunch of really talented game developers. We, we start to enjoy the suspension of disbelief, this feeling that it's happening in real time for the first time ever for anyone, minus any real risk. And the question among many others is how the technology, whether it's machine learning, artificial intelligence, neural networks, whatever's lurking around the corner can start to guide us based on not just efficiency and safety patterns, but actually on empathy. And I haven't figured out this connection. I'm not sure if anyone has, but these are the types of questions that we're gonna to start to ask ourselves and they're not easy ones to answer. So what we've done for you guys today is we've put together a dream team of panelists to help us understand where this might be all going. And the way we're gonna do this panel is this. I'm gonna introduce each one of our amazing panelists and they're gonna paint us their picture. And as they speak, feel free to ask questions via chat or Zoom Q and A. And we can use those later as discussion topics after each panelist has completed this story. And I'm gonna do this in, in no particular order, but um, I'm gonna start with Kat, Kat Henkel. Uh, as a friend of mine, she is a immersive theater writer and producer, as well as an accomplished science fiction novelist. Her, week, her work has been seen at the Philadelphia Fringe Festival, and she's currently the showrunner for the Philadelphia Immersive Experience Meetup. Her first, uh, forthcoming online immersive project, En Route, a collaboration with members of Ferryman Collective and others, 
is going to debut this summer. Hey, Kat. Hi, Rob. Thanks a lot. Thanks for joining <laughs> us. Kat, the big question. You're a playwright. You think about these things. You're into sci-fi. What does the data-driven world look like to you in 10 years? Great. Thank you. So I'll start with what I'm doing right now. So the way I'm looking at empathy and digital storytelling is creating an online experience called En Route. And just to level set, immersive theater is when the audience and the actors occupy the same space physically and narratively. So there is no fourth wall. So my team for En Route came together as strangers and we found common ground discussing how this year due to the pandemic, we've seen conflict in balancing personal desires with the good of the community. So we created a scenario where you're on a spaceship en route to a new earth colony when you're suddenly awakened to learn that the ship's life support is failing. And then the audience also is unbeknownst to them, given one of three perspectives and told that's the truth. Then at key points throughout the show, the audience votes on what happens next. So we'll track whether the per perspective they're given at the outset impacts how they vote and if they can change their mindset and work together with those with a different perspective. Um, and then we'll also have a post-show decompression chamber where the audience can discuss how their personal and communal decisions played out. So starting from that point, that's a re real thing we can do today. What could we have in the future? And so I came up with this idea called an emotional escape room. So I'm thinking about how like millennials and Gen Z and later generations are way more in tune with mental health and willing to engage with their friends and followers at an emotional level. So I'm looking at things like TikTok videos where we have fan fiction and role playing and sharing emotionally vulnerable personal experiences with like a really broad audience. Um, I'm also thinking about personal trackers and they're already trying to get into the emotional space. So I'm thinking of something like Amazon's Halo, which measures like the tone of your voice to try to understand what you're thinking and feeling. Um, it, we could get a lot deeper with that. And then also building upon the tenets of Nordic LARP, which is live action role play. And it centers on emotion, not action. And then present day text such as The Void, which is live VR games, or The Under Presents, which is live VR theater. And then imagine text such as in Ready Player One, where the people are pretending to be the character in the movie and acting things out that way. So basically pulling all this together with also the idea of an escape room. So imagine this, 10 years from now, you and your friends are planning what to do on a Friday night. And all week, your personal tracker has been collecting info on your emotional state, same as for your friends. It's even compared emotional states during conversations and interactions between you. Maybe you get an alert after a video chat you had with your friend, Chris, that maybe they're a little upset about something you said, a feature they've opted into because you're friends. These kind of alerts help you maintain friendships and measure your impact on friends, family, and coworkers. So you, Chris, and some other friends plan to go to an emotional escape room on Friday night. And you all opt to have a subset of your data sent to the room, which uses the data and machine learning to tailor one of several ready-made available scenarios to you and your group. Think of how like you go to an escape room and there's like the pirate room, the archeology span room, whatever, all these different ones. So when you arrive, you'll all put on VR headsets and trackers that the room provides that measure heart rate and other physiological aspects to see how you're doing with the experience. And instead of typical puzzles, you enter a series of scenarios with interactions between you and your team and computer NPCs, non-player characters, that can only be solved through teamwork and utilization of high EQ responses. And on the back end, we have psychologists and sociologists who work for the room and they're watching. So they're able to tweak the machine response if needed and they're allowing you to progress when you make a good response. So since the upsetting interaction between you and Chris was submitted, the room will have created a scenario that gives space for you and Chris to explore what may be troubling your relationship, but all within the safe environment that rewards emotional vulnerability. And after you get through the room, each player gets the personal breakdown of their actions. You could opt to have this data synced back to your usual data tracker to get alerts and reminders when future interactions mirror what you faced and learned in the room. And all of it serves to help people explore and improve in the areas of vulnerability, communication, and empathy. That's super interesting, Kat. I was, I was, as you were describing this, I started to think about what it would be like to, to actually have that experience with a group of friends. And, uh, you, you know, and, and, and I think your last, the last sentence kind of nailed it for me. You know, as, as we move into these, um, you know, this evolution of vulnerability, you know, that we're, we're starting to see. And, and, you know, 
you know, um, emotional intelligence, driving decisions, um, you know, not necessarily as a priority, but given equal weight, what does that mean for these types of games? And, and how will, you know, how will they help us develop as humans? I kept on thinking of like real life experiences as you're talking about this mm -hmm. and saying, okay, well, this feels like an actual situation, but now I have insights that I never had, not only on myself, but the people that are going through this with me. Um, totally. You know, and then this, this idea that you could have a better understanding about your friends or, you know, loved ones um, on, on, on the other side of this. That's super cool. Thanks. That's really cool. All right, next panelist, um, we're gonna move over to our friend, David Hoppy. David is a 25 year veteran of the tabletop and video game industry. He had his start at Wizards of the Coast as part of the funding team that developed organized play for Magic the Gathering, which uh, no one's heard of. And uh, after leaving that, he worked on something called, oh, oh, sorry, he also led the team that developed the Pokemon League. Nothing, don't know what that is. And uh, the original Friday Night Magic. And after leaving, um, he worked on You Guy O, Xbox Live, and a myriad of mobile games. In 2017, David returned to tabletop gaming, and he's currently the president of Gen Con, home of the best four days in gaming, an annual gathering of 70,000 gaming fans in Indianapolis. Hey, David, thanks for joining us. Hey, Rob, thanks. Um, I, uh, uh, based on what I do now, I spend a lot of time uh, thinking about how people gather and what people do when they gather. And so when thinking about what this is gonna, things are gonna look like uh, four years or 10 years from now, uh, I spent some time thinking about how people are gonna tell the stories of what they do, similarly to how, uh, you know, right now people will do blogs or vlogs or live stream from events like Gen Con. They wanna share, uh, the things that they they see and they hear. Uh, and I think as we enter into an era where people are collecting more and more data, more and more sensory input, uh, that they will also have the ability to share that. Uh, and so I created a short little narrative that describes what I think that might look like uh, in 10 years. So I'll just say awesome. uh, read that off really quickly. So this is a story of Madeline. She's 27 years old and she's an active cosplay fanatic. And she's heading to the largest annual anime, comics and games convention in the country. She's walking up to the convention center and the weather is hot and sunny outside, but inside the convention center, the halls are cool and there's a buzz of anticipation in the air. From the minute she approaches the convention center, she can feel her wrist tracker vibrating with notifications from friends who are in proximity, where they are, what they are wearing, what their cosplay looks like. The buzz of anticipation is already registering as a beta node. The sensors on her purple and gold wings are in full receive transmit mode. She flips her glasses to enhance tracking setting and is attracted to a corner of the convention center based on the strong emote upload readout that shows high energy and high visual scoring. And that always means that something amazing is happening there. She switches over to high collect mode, which starts tracking and uploading all the physical stimuli her body is receiving, her moods, the timber of her thoughts. She also switches to public share mode and starts contributing her data to the festival Ouroboros, the data warehouse that tracks and narrates the public zeitgeist of the convention. It's from this web of collected experiences that stories are pulled and she's developed her own AI to stream her real time story feed in a way that she knows her friends and family like. She's about to go into live mode because her sister in the Philippines keeps pinging her for it, but suddenly an alarm goes off. What kind of an alarm is it? The emote, the emote upload is showing a high panic node in exhibit hall A and people are starting to stream for the exit. She is uploading mild panic data and just as she's about to head out the door, she gets a message that it is in fact a false alarm. There was a temporary breach and the panic node was a simulation planted by hackers. Tonight, Madeline reminds herself, she will have to edit this data block from her curated journal entry, especially for the public version. This reminder is automatically stored. She checks her story, story cred balance. Already, she is at five stars for her, contribution, her contributions to the Ouroboros. She can tell this is gonna be a great day. That's cool. That's so I cool. think, yeah, 
it's kind of this idea that you can, you with all the tracking and all the data that is collected in real time experiences, you can contribute to your own story. You can track your own story. You contribute to a story of an event or of a time and a place, you know, the story of a city on a given day. Uh, I think that, that there will be an opportunity to control the sharing that you, you put in and then what you take out. And I think that's gonna be a, uh, a fascinating new way to, to see how you know, the stories of our lives are, are collected and shared. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, as you describe it, and similar to to you know when when Kat was talking us through 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 her her vision there, it's like, you know, I, this is applicable to everyday life as well. Like it, 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 you know, and I think that's the the one of the big points that, or one of the big conclusions we may come to is that you know there's this intersection between what, how we define games and and real life. And as we are, are figuring out how we can leverage the tools and technology in the future, it, that it's becoming more and more, those lines are becoming more and more blurred. You know? Yeah, and I think that you know, when we have these, these rich stores of data, uh, they, can, they can, again, function as a storytelling device, but they can also function as, a, as input for games. Like games can be created out of this rich metadata. And, uh, everybody can be a part of that that meta game experience potentially. Um, I think it's it. Uh, you know, I really look forward to the time where you know. Again, as I mentioned, I, I think about people gathering together at festivals and things like that. Um, that it becomes more than just the the experience of of being and seeing, but also participating in something that is happening at a whole other level. Yeah, that's wild. Thank you, David. I'm going to marinate on that for a little bit. Next panelist, um, I'm excited to introduce my friend, uh, Alif Kalfan. He's uh, uh, currently the Director of Innovation at the Walt Disney Company. Uh, he also strategically um, advises several startups, and he serves as the Chairman for the Western United States on the Aga Khan Education Board. Um, Alif has filed 11 patents and he holds a Bachelor of Science in Computer Science from Stanford University. Alif, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Rob. Appreciate yeah. it. So tell us, um, you know, from your perspective, Director of Innovation at the Walt Disney Company and, and so much more, what, is this, what does this future look like for us? Sure. Well, I can only predict what I can predict, and I'm sure it will be wildly off, but kind of the way I've been watching technology progress over the past 10 years and then looking forward for the next 10 years is a combination of things. Number one is, is the peripherals that we use and how those are going to change and evolve in the future. And then secondarily is what are the products that are gonna be on those different peripherals? So to me, the iPhone is one of the most notable inventions of the past 10 years. It's totally changed the way we go about our lives and, and, and kind of go about our business personally and for, for business. And looking forward, I've sort of been waiting on the next peripheral to exist that's going to then change the world again. And I don't think that's going to be a smaller or a bigger iPhone. I think it's going to be augmented reality glasses or something on our face that's hands-free that we can then peer into the world in a different way. And so if I use that as the framework for where we're going to go and what we're going to be able to do with technology, I kind of think of it as, okay, we're going to have, of course, perhaps still our phones, but a lens in which to view the world that we can then see every time we open up our eyes. So think about that and then think about the concept of, of data and where is data today? So today, every platform that you go on, social media network that you, that you sign into with your account, the data is owned by those platforms. So of course, when you see a world in the future, I see a world where we get to own our own data. And two things become very powerful from that. Well, number one is, Today, your data is being monetized by the platform, and you then now may have the opportunity to monetize your own data yourself, or at least get a cut of that from the platform as a result of you sharing your data with the platform. So there's a lot more sense of ownership and control when it comes to data in and of itself. Now, the, the real thing here is, is what are the products that are going to exist and how are users going to interact with everything in the world around them and the people around them? And I come from the world of gaming similar, um, similarly. I spent the last 10 years 
in the games and interactive experiences space, focusing on games. And one thing that I've noticed, and of course I'm biased here, is that with any new peripheral or any new product that is new and, and emerging, games are typically the, the most immersive and highest retentive product that can exist on those platforms. So when augmented reality glasses come out, you can bet that there's going to be games on it. And you can bet those are gonna be the most popular things that people get to use, that the people will use it for. Of course, there'll be productivity and utility and everything like that, but games is what people are also going to be attracted to. So I think about it in the world of games and picture this, I'm wearing my augmented reality glasses. I'm walking about my world and I decide that I wanna enter my game. I wanna enter the game that everyone's playing and I flip it on or I talk to it and it enters the game. And I'm still in the real world and this game takes place in the real world. So as I'm walking about, I'm able to interact with perhaps checkpoints, trying to capture areas, trying to compete or collaborate with my friends in the real world through these games within my own neighborhoods. And perhaps I could even get transported virtually to different locations for me to interact with different places as well. So that's one concept that I really am excited about is just being able to have the game as sort of your metaverse and you, be, you get to live in it and interact with it and shape it over time. This metaverse is something that is persistent. So when you make a change or when you make an edit to it, everyone else who walks by, who interacts with the same area kind of gets to see what you've done to it. And where does data come into this? Well, we can think about the, the you as a user, as a player, and the, the data that you've collected, the data that you've earned, currencies, whatever habits, getting implemented into it. But you can also think about your real live data. So perhaps what you're doing at the moment, and perhaps how you're feeling, and perhaps what you're saying can also influence that world. And that's something that is new and novel. And that data also is persistent for others to influence. So the way I see it is this world and the future will this, this concept of a metaverse, we'll get to play in it, we'll get to interact with it, and we'll get to try and shape it how the users want it to be shaped. And that's as far as I've been able to predict. I think anything beyond there is just too fanatical and too fantastic, but I'm super excited about where we're going to go. Yeah, you know, I, I, whenever, whenever we do these types of exercises, I immediately go to like science fiction that we know. And, and I started to picture like Caprica, you guys remember that? Um, you know, the, the Battlestar spinoff and just like the idea of, of this alternative place and, you know, and, and ultimately that becoming um, more important in many ways than, than the reality that we know. And so I, as you describe that, it's exactly what I see. And, and I think, you know, we could all talk about this for days, but we've seen traces of it already, you know, um, in primitive ways and, and some more advanced, but uh, no, it's uh, it's 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 super interesting to think about that. And then you know, to your point, like you know, just being able to pick up any time and and jump in there and and take it from there. It's uh, it's 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 yeah, it's cool. Kat, you have a book. You have a book you want to recommend? Yeah, the book War Cross by Marie Lu um, <clears throat> is all about like it starts with those augmented reality glasses and a world a game overlaid on the world. Really good. It's cool, thanks. That's awesome, I love these conversations. Um, and I'm excited because uh, our next panelist, um, I'm excited to talk to, his name is um, Scaff Elias and he's a successful game designer with a very rich career spanning over decades. And like David, um, he comes from Wizards of the Coast where he worked on Magic the Gathering and uh, was the designer of many Magic sets and credited with the invention of the Magic Pro Tour. Uh, he's the co-author of D&D Manual Miniatures Handbook, as well as worked on many other projects, including something called Mind Twist, which is a free-to-play strategy game. Um, it's good to see you. Hello, it's good to be here. Um, uh, I, I don't know that I have um, as rich a connection with uh, narrative as a lot of the other people here, uh, but my background is in games and specifically in, uh, not dissimilar to David's, but in... Um, in organized play for games. And so uh, the, the way I see um, things going in the future is actually kind of a lot based upon how they've gone in the past. Um, the thing is in the, in the 
in the digital world, especially, um, you have uh, you have an amazing opportunity to push narrative, but um, there's all, there's generally a disconnect with games because games are based on indeterminacy, and so it it makes the combining of narrative with games tricky to say the least. Like it's not uh, it's not a simple task, and it it's very easy to do it incorrectly, and um, and things like uh, you know traditional elements of um, you know, like uh, setting and character and theme, uh, those um, work extremely well in games, but specifically the narrative less so. And uh, there's examples of it working, but there's many examples of it failing. And, and that's because of the clash of a narrative is generally, a, you know, it's a story, it's a, a set of things that happen and, uh, and games thrive on indeterminacy. If you know the outcome of a game, then you don't play it. There's no, there's no need to. And so, um, you know, what just as it was getting good. Yeah, he had us. <laughs> I feel like he did that on purpose. He's like, I'm going to get you guys, suck you guys into my vision here. I'm going to go. Um, okay. We'll give him a second to connect, to, to reconnect. But uh, while he's doing that, a question came in. And uh, it's, it's for a leaf. It is with the level of granularity in, da in data sharing, do you see us becoming more private individuals or more open and interactive? That's a good question. I think if there are other panelists who have thoughts, I would love to hear their feedback as well. My perspective is, is that we won't, as a collective society, move one way or another but we will become more bimodal within those two, those two options. So you'll see a lot of people become more isolated and more independent, and they're going to prefer to stay in their own worlds and not want to interact with or give data to anybody. And you'll see another huge pocket of people who want to be very collaborative, who want to be very open in data sharing. And you're going to have those two worlds and societies living in parallel. Hmm. Sorry about that. Hey, you're back. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't know when I cut out. Uh, you just started, it. you had just started to, to, to get into it with us. We were excited. You had us. Uh, it has, uh, did I talk about baseball? No, no. Oh my gosh. I've been gone a long time. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I, did I, did I cut out? I was saying it's tricky to combine the narrative with games because yep. games thrive on indeterminacy. They actually require it. Uh, for it, it, it to even be what we think of as a game. Um, and that's kind of in a way the opposite of a narrative. Uh, so uh, I said, instead of going you know, into the future, um, you know, uh, first let's take a look back in the past because there have been uh, interesting ways that uh, narrative and empathy have been married to this indeterminacy. And, and so the, the example I was using is baseball where um, it, you, 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 it's hard to find a game that's, that has more indeterminacy in it than baseball. Like it's extremely random what happens pitch to pitch, much less uh, game to game. And yet in our national psyche, we have this um, the, oh, many rich narratives really based upon this narrative. Um, uh, sorry, narrative based upon uh, this, these games like Babe Ruth is a great example. Like he come, everyone knows Babe Ruth's story, or at least they did. I'll use a more modern example in a second. And, um, and to, to the point where uh, it takes upon this mythological character and at, at the point when the narrative has been sort of retrofitted onto the data generated essentially randomly, um, then when new random data comes out, it's easy to sort of fit it into the narrative as it continues. So like, the called shot that Babe Ruth has is something that wouldn't be interesting if it happened to someone who's this was their first at bat. And, um, and this is actually how I think that, you know, the digital world, especially, it's not so much a narrative driving digital interactions or so much as I think in the future, you'll have a lot of the ability to collect this data will allow people to construct narratives uh, on the story. Uh, of, of a person's game um, playing experience, but it doesn't have to be a game. It can be anything they do online will be, um, will be useful if the data is collected in the proper way. 
and if there's a common understanding of what that data means. So um, again, to use the example of baseball, it, it, everyone, data began to be collected in it just for strictly logistical purposes of the sport, how to determine who's good, who's not good, what actually happened. And then this becomes, this turns into a common understanding of what is happening. And from that time, you know, a lot of people have decided that really almost the most interesting part about sports is the narrative that can be constructed out of this uh, randomly collected data that we all agree to. And so, um, and so that, that's, uh, that's really, I think, you know, sort of the interesting uh, opportunity in the future. Uh, you can look at a, you know, a tragic story like Kobe Bryant and it, it, it affects people in a deep emotional way what happened with him, but why? Well, the only reason why is because we have this immense amount of data of what happened to him before. And it mattered what all the randomness then collectivized and, and, and tied into a thread happened to him before in his life. The, um, and so th that's exactly the sort of thing that on a smaller level, I believe will happen with people going forward. When, when we try to design things in organized play, it's always important to have the data there, to collect it and to organize it in a way that's useful for people. And always, you know, show them what, not just what they've done, but how what they've done fits into the larger picture. Um, and so that, that's really what I, what I think about, you know, what will happen in the future, especially if people are very careful about designing what data they want to promote to people and what data they want to collect um, as the people have their interactions on the internet. You know, as you uh, started to think about a baseball game where, you know, maybe the, the group of us are watching the same exact game, but the events that unfold are completely different based on, on our likes and dislikes. So imagine watching like a game between two opposing teams and, and your team it, it, that you are rooting for historically is having is much more interesting than the other team. And that experience, like the, the whole game is different for you. And I, I, I just started to riff on what you're saying, like this idea that, that you know why they're, they're, we're trying to establish that feedback loop and give, you know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a, you know, when you watch, I don't know if anyone watches the Olympics anymore, but if you're old enough and you watch the Olympics, half of it was what's happening with the sport and half of it was people constructing a narrative so that whatever happens randomly is going to be interesting to you. And it doesn't matter. You don't know if the person's going to win the gold medal or if they're going to break their leg. Um, maybe it's a sad story. Maybe it's a happy story, but it's a story that's just really um, kind of the groundwork has been laid with the previous random data, a little bit of storytelling in the middle. And then, you know, you see, you get to see what happens at the end to yeah. form that emotional connection to the player. I immediately thought of, of course, Tanya, Tanya Harding and Nancy Kerrigan as you're describing this, but just that's what everyone was talking about, you know, when it was, I mean, I'm old enough to remember, but it was like, that was, that was a huge deal. And I don't want to say that it made the Olympics more interesting, but I think that it did, it did. Sure. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was tragic, but, but it made it, it brought drama to it that, that made it exciting and you wanted to root, you know, there was a, a hero and a villain, you know, right. But, but they weren't constructed out of nothing. They were constructed out of all of this random data that had happened beforehand. Yeah. So. Yeah. Thanks, man. That was great. Um, next up, last but definitely not least, we, we have Peter. Peter Rulian, and he's a former Microsoft exec where he worked extensively in the games division. His career includes extensive work in narrative design. He's a published novelist, a composer, and a producer of recorded and live narrative-based music. He's a panelist at fan and, um, fan and fiction conferences all over where he teaches the craft of storytelling. And he also consults extensively on future platform trends in gaming. Um, these are all great things. Happy to have you here, Peter. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. So Peter, tell us, you know, we, we've built up to you. Bring us home. Um, well, the best way for me to I think talk about this, uh, I think it's really hard to think about what things are gonna look like in 10 years. Um, 
rather what I'll do is talk about something that I've already begun to ideate on with Lydian. Um, so I think it's actually more near term. Oh, did I just lose my feed? You, you, we could hear you, we can't see you. Oh, now we can't hear him. Oh, he's back. Sorry, my, my other camera lost battery. Um, so now you can see the ugliness of my, my recording studio behind me. Uh, it looks very authentic. Well, that's where I, that's where I do a bunch of recording. Um, what I was saying is I've begun to do some ideation with Lydian on, on top of a property that I've already built that I think lends itself really well to um, sort of gamifying an experience um, that at its core is about empathy. So I'll set that as the framework and then I'll talk about how that ways that might get deployed. So I wrote uh, sort of a rock opera um, that is tells the story of a bell ringer. So we all, most of us have seen this, this image, this holiday sort of image of the bell ringer out in the cold ringing for pennies. And that image struck me as a kid. I wanted to know the story of someone who was willing to stand in the freezing cold to ring for pennies. Um, and so later in life, I, I got around to doing this and I wrote a, a full show. Um, we've taken it on tour. I wrote, my literary agent has the full novel. And so I've got this, this, um, this fully realized story about this character who um, has had every trial in life. Uh, I deliberately have, have him be this, this person who has had just challenge after challenge. So that when we enter with him at the story, we see a guy who um, feels like he's got nothing to offer. And through the course of the narrative, what happens is his interactions with people who are in destitution, um, who are uh, critically ill, you know, people in, in basically a really rough part of the Bronx, um, he, he becomes the exact right person to, to speak to them, to, to um, help bear their suffering, to defend them, all kinds of things by virtue of the, the challenges he's had. So, you know, this is this character who is, um, uh, finds this sense of self-worth by giving of himself. So I got talking with Arca about this and we started thinking about, okay, well, how do we, how could we take something like that? Because what really excites me about what Lydian's doing is the prospect of telling a story that can drive actions that have social good. Like I, I, I love games uh, and I still play games, but maybe it's just a function of where I am in life is I really like the idea of storytelling in games that um, have some, I don't know, virtue to them, uh, encourage some good social behavior. So as a consequence, we started thinking about, well, imagine if we took and we create a non-linear way for, for people who decide to enjoin themselves to a game experience with, you know, call it the bell ringer, and with no affiliation to any particular doctrine, just, just a, a human kindness idea uh, and giving of self. And then um, create that in a non-linear way, um, built upon the, the, the thrust of the narrative that I've already created, but creating them kind of in a non-linear episodic way. Um, so one example would be, you know, one of the, the things that happens in the course of the book, of course, is um, trying to collect money in order to, to uh, have funds to buy people food who need food. Um, so now imagine that in the course of your, your week, you're going to the grocery store and you've decided to be a bell ringer. You've decided to enjoy yourself to this gamification, this experience of of, at a really high level, I'm going, to, I'm going to do good for others. But what happens is you're, the data that you're, you have by location tracking and even partnerships that we could set up with, food, with, the, with the food industry, and I'll talk about some other examples, would signal to you, hey, I'm in Safeway. There's, a, there's an entire stand there where if I purchase the beans from Del Monte, um, the Safeway is going to give a whole case of that over to the food shelter in my community. And so we set up a, a a, a whole strata of partnerships across all kinds of verticals. It could be healthcare, um, it could be military, and I can talk about that in a minute. And then what happens is by virtue of where you're at in your life and associations you have physically, emotionally, you get these signals and it, allow, it, it, it pre pre presents to you an opportunity to do some social good. And in so doing, we can reward the person. That reward can come by way of content. We've, we've talked about some very robust content creation ideas. 
where the person gets to see this is how the happened in the bell ringer's life. And you become invested in how the bell ringer is going to kind of achieve this sense of self-worth through his narrative while you're effectively doing the same thing. And as, and in the process, um, you're actually having an impact in your, in your community. Um, the same thing could happen with, you know, you drive by a hospital. Um, my wife and I did some, some volunteer work at the children's hospital near where we live. And all we did was go in and wash toys because the kids who have cancer can't play with toys that have potentially got germs on them. But it was a very rewarding experience in the smallest, like the smallest personal, you know, um, offering of time. So now imagine that, you know, I'm just driving by there and I've said, hey, I want to be a bell ringer. I'm in this game. It says there's an opportunity to go and volunteer time to do this for kids in this interest. And then you do that and there could be an, an, uh, an opening up of content and a furtherance in the game of, the, of this idea of, of being a bell ringer. Um, and then we've got some ideas to build a really, really robust sort of tent pole content experience that you can unlock you know, as a way of doing this. But your story needn't be precisely linear the way the bell ringer uh, does it. Um, and and we, can, we can actually create this in a way to, to abstract some of the things you might do that could open up um, parts of the narrative and um, ways for you to give back into your community. And, and the reason I think that this ties well in a narrative sense is because most good storytelling, once you're, I mean, there is this whole idea of science fiction as the, as the, as the literature of ideas, and there's some value to that. But usually what, what remains resonant about a story is the character and, and um, the things they do. Um, and th that is how usually empathy is created. And so in this same way, uh, you, the, the person that's in the game um, can, be, can uh, perform empathy, they can show empathy. And I, this might be my own ideology, but I feel like um, anybody who sort of undertakes to do any of these kinds of, call them altruistic behaviors, they're gonna feel the personal reward. And of course that could get captured too. And I think that's a personal setting that people get to decide how much emotional data they want the world to know about. Um, but if, if we just kind of tacitly agree that, you know, helping people in need is a good idea, then this particular, um, you know, in, uh, deployment a Lydian against some sort of narrative gives us a host of opportunities uh, for people to be doing things with some sort of social consciousness for the good of their community. I'm really excited. You know, we've, we've done some planning. I'm really excited to build this out. That's cool. You know, I, I uh, talked to um, a friend yesterday. He uh, started working with a company called Samaritan. Have you guys heard of this company out of, out of Seattle? And they, uh, they, they basically provide like beacons to um, people who are uh, um, houseless. And uh, you, can, you can use your smartphone to basically, you know, um, give somebody credits or help them out. And it's, they've got this whole gamification level where um, it's, it's creating incentives for people to, to get better or to work towards like financial independence, et cetera, et cetera. And it's really interesting. And it reminds me a little of your, of, of your story in some ways. Um, it, it's really yeah. cool. I, think I, I guess part of what I like about it is I think that there's reward just in doing the thing itself. Uh, and I think um, we, we, we do wanna have some objectives and, and things for people to work toward. But I, I think intrinsic to the idea is that um, the performance of these acts of kindness are their own reward. Um, and I think that that can have this sort of virtuous cycle uh, and hopefully create this kind of stuff even outside the game. Um, so, you know, th in this way, you stipulating to having people, you know, in this case, maybe Lydian have access to your data in order to, to, to signal to you opportunities to do this and to reward you for doing it. Um, I think it is a, is a wonderful sort of combination of technology and, you know, and, con and social consciousness. So. Yeah. yeah, that's cool, Peter. Thank you. Um, guys, we have a couple questions that came in. Did, can you guys see the questions, by the way? Um, as well, as, okay, so let's go with the first one. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna ask uh, David, if he wants to jump in and start talking about this one, I'll read it. Isn't a future where virtual worlds are more important than the real world a scary proposition? Um, that is a, that is a, a big question. 
And how do we balance this next level of interactive entertainment with ensuring that players are still grounded within reality and care about issues that plague society, including climate change, et cetera. Um, so how do you, and whoa, this is, there's so many different ways to answer this, David. So, well, I'll, I'll start with what, what strikes me as the relatively easy part of that question, which is um, virtual worlds are important. We see them, uh, you know, growing in importance, but I don't think that virtual worlds will ever replace real world interaction, uh, particularly in kind of the, the realms that I think about, which again is, you know, people gathering or as, you know, as Scaff was talking about sports, you know, all these games are, are indeterminate. They could be just, you know, um, resolved on a, on a computer, but in fact, we do play the games, right? And, and, you know, people match up on paper and one team would be favored to beat the other team. And, you know, there's an upset suddenly, you know, Gonzaga goes down uh, or, um, you know, and then the, the expression is that's why we play the games. Uh, so I think uh, I don't worry. It's a scary proposition, except I'm not scared by it. I think the human desire to, uh, to do things collectively uh, and in person will transcend that. Um, now people may participate in those real world interactions uh, much more broadly, like you may be able to, you know, how people experience sports or how people experience conventions like I run or concerts or events. Uh, I think that can potentially change quite a bit. Uh, and of course the underlying economics of that could change as well. But um, so it, I think it is still possible that, that you know, People can go off into a Ready Player One sort of world and and uh, have trouble getting back. Um, I don't have an easy answer to that, other than to say that you know I'm optimistic that the things that are still real in the real world will always be potent enough uh, to draw people back to the real world and and to stay grounded and care about the things that are happening yeah. uh, around. Yeah, them. I always think that there's going to be you know basically this point where the um, what what is referred to in the question as a virtual world or what Alif called a, a metaverse that that these um, are are so in sync with our own world that they're kind of one and the same. And so when I talked at the beginning, kind of about the Tesla, you know, I'm I'm kind of playing a game, but I'm also like going to where I need to go, and 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 do it, living my life. And so I always think that there's going to be this weird moment where some technology, and I don't know if it exists yet, but this technology is going to make it so we don't, we don't look at them as separate anymore. Yeah, and I think that that's okay, right? I mean, I think that, that um, although I guess it's, it, you know, it comes down to choices, like can you, do you want to look at them as one and the same? Or do you want to choose to be sort of all in on a virtual side, or do you want to stay in in the in the physical realm? And I think that's going to be the big the big thing, hopefully going forward. And I think that's one of the big questions here is you know how empowered are individuals going to be? How much agency and how much choice are they going to have in um, in you know use of their data to construct these narratives? Uh, you know, I think. You know, in answering the, the question earlier, you know, are people going to be more sharing or more private as a result of all this data? I, I would, again, you know, sort of harken back to the way people have always been. I don't think human behavior is going to change. There will be people who are much more extroverted and sharing of the, you know, the day-to-day -day minutia of their lives. And there are going to be people who remain much more private about their lives and consequently their data as well. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Alif, I want to ask you this next one. Um, what are the some of the biggest challenges that you think game designers are going to face when balancing compelling gameplay, uh, specifically interesting game mechanics, with narrative? That's a good question. I was actually I was actually curious if you were going to ask Scaff because he's, he's I'm got a lot more for, experience. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm hoping area. he'll jump in, but I want you to kick it off. Okay, sure, sure. Yeah, I mean. So, so I think that a lot of the challenges that, that game designers face in the future are similar to ones that they face today. It's really the platform, it's like platform agnostic. You have to figure out how to 
reel in your audience, reel in your, your customer with the, the, the game that they're playing. And then you think about like, okay, what's the platform? Historically, it's been, you, you, for me, you have like a screen and you have a, a phone or you have a computer or you have a, a, a console. And so you're, that's, the, that's the mechanism by which you're using to interact with the gameplay and the compelling story and the narrative. But like in the future, you may be interacting with the real world. And then of course the tabletop, there's, it's, a different, it's a different mode as well. So I'm thinking about, um, assuming the question is related to that future where you're not necessarily carrying around a joystick or a phone screen or something like that. Like you're using your body and your actions and your mind in order to interact or your voice or something like this. So it really comes down to knowing what the, those different variables, those different parameters you have, and then trying to create something that's really important and compelling and, and interesting to the user to want them to, to make them want to do the things that you want them to do. So whether it's it's a sports related game in the real world that makes you run, makes you jump, makes you do physical activity, whether it's something that's more stationary um, and you, you're just kind of like thinking and you're, you're, you're doing things more um, statically. I think it's really just about, it's really about like understanding your, your parameters and coming up with compelling story. Jeff, what do you think? Well, uh, just, just to answer the, the question sort of uh, like directly as far as the challenges to see get them out on the table. I mean, I think this is sort of pretty obvious. The classic example is you're making a Star Wars game and you want people to be able to play maybe both sides or maybe maybe I'm playing Luke Skywalker. Well, can I lose? If I can't lose, then that's taking agency away from me. And that's certainly taking away some indeterminacy from the outcome. And if I can play either side, then the same question arises, you know, who is supposed to win, who's not supposed to win. So that's like the basic level challenge. And, and if even in, that's obviously with a licensed story, but even if you construct one, there's a lot of video games where you really can't lose. I mean, that people have decided they have a certain narrative that they want to push. And, um, and again, I'm only going over the failure cases. There are successful cases, but just like the question is what the challenges are. So the challenges are you have a narrative and, and because that determines the outcome, that's taking agency away from the player. A lot of times players play through one time and that doesn't matter. Sometimes you can trick them. They don't even know that they didn't have agency. They don't even know that they really couldn't have lost. Uh, but it's not generally a very replayable game. And those games are, they tend to be one and done. And they're more, they're a lot more like someone picking up a comic book and reading it or a larger book, a novel and reading it uh, than they are what you would traditionally think of like as a game, which lasts for a long time. Let's say it's, well, I'll use the same old example of baseball or maybe it's poker or maybe it's Magic the Gathering or Pokemon, you know, these things that are lasting 20, 30 years. And there's a lot of games that people play online that have, again, lasted 20 or 30 years. Uh, and, or, you know, 10 year old games are very common. What's not common is 10 year old games where the player doesn't have the ability to lose. So mm. that, that's the, again, because of the agency uh, thing there. Yeah. Kat, you got anything to add to that? Because they were just saying, what are the challenges, right? So <laughs> yeah, that is yeah. the challenge. Um, and it can be successfully solved. It has been successfully solved. It's just challenging. Yeah. Kat, what do you I think? Mean, I would argue that there, there are plenty of games, and I'm, I'm not a game maker. I just know a lot of them from the immersive world that that are thinking about cooperative games or you know, that, are, that the object of the game is not winning or losing. Um, but I think that one of the interesting aspects, and I dropped a Twitter thread in here that had got me thinking earlier this week, um, just about like thinking about with the game, the, the agency aspects. So like when you're talking to a non-player character and you have this, you know, three options of what you could say. And if you, if two are similar and one's different, and if you didn't pick it that time, would you ever get the chance to ask them that again? And, you know, that opportunity just passed. And so there is sort of this like feeling of loss when you have that moment. But you, so, so building those maps and, and that branching narrative is, is one of the biggest challenges and still making the narrative um, fulfilling to the player. And then I was thinking from the immersive side, so like you can program, the computer can think of a million different, you know, you can give them all these options. They will never forget their lines. They will always perform exactly how they are programmed to perform. But then if in immersive theater and live theater, if that was you talking to an actor, 
they can be creative. They can think on the spot. They can change the direction of the game. Although within the limitations of time, space, what they know to say, um, the script, the narrative that's written, but it's like try, trying to think about like, that's a really interesting thing we could play with in the future is having live players as, as our characters in a game or having these computerized characters. And then with AI and machine learning, can their abilities expand? It, it, you know, it, it makes me want to ask this question and I'll, I'll start with Peter, you know, as, as a game producer and, and a storyteller, do you feel that there's going to be a point where um, it's less fun for the people creating the narrative and creating the stories if the audience has, or the player has much more control in fact than, you know, than the God who created it? No, I, I don't think so. I mean, it's, it. I've been thinking as we've been going along about um, people I've worked with over the years and franchises I've worked on. I remember when we released Halo 2, Pete Parsons in his, all of his executive briefings during E3 said nothing except about the story of Halo. Um, but if you, but players don't parrot that back. You know that that's not the thing they care most about. Um, and if you continue to play at that, you ultimately win, right? But nevertheless it had significant um, user base, still does. Um, there's, there's sandbox games where it's, it's much less clear what success looks like. It's more um, existing inside that world and doing things, achieving things. Um, and achievement may not mean any sort of triumphant win with the big cinematic at the end, but that's less important to people in, sand in sandbox um, gameplay. Um, you know, and I also thought about Peter Moore when he launched the Fable fan tr fa franchise with this whole idea that choices impacted sort of character development. So I think that there are opportunities to, to do that. And that can be built more smartly now than it was before. Um, I think that for, for narrative designers, there's always going to be, I think, an, an audience, a gamer audience, um, to play through a game that has a logical or even known conclusion. You know, I... I would love to get into a TIE fighter and be Luke Skywalker. They may make it really hard for me to win and to destroy the Death Star. Um, and, but reliving that, there's a, there's, a, there's a brand of fulfillment in getting to be the hero, yeah, even with a known conclusion. And then the, a lot of the game design is, is, can, can be you know, more robust um, fleshing out of that world, changing the, you could change the, the, if Lucas would let you, or if Disney would let you, you could sort of augment the, the narrative. But I think that there's also narrative design that sort of sets um, a world in motion with certain, um, you know, governing laws. And, and inside those, there's a lot of room for creating your own narrative. This is a little bit more like what I was describing earlier with what we were doing with Lydian. There's an, there's an overarching sort of ethos for what you do, but it, um, we're, it's not on rails. It's more, it's more like a sandbox game. So I, um, I don't think that there's any you know, going to be any limitation or any proclivity for narrative designers to do one or the other in the future. Gotcha. Oh, well, thank you. Guys, um, we did it. We're at the end. Uh, I want to thank you all for, for joining um, and being part of the festival uh, and, and everyone watching live uh, or, or tuning in later uh, to a recorded version. I, I, I don't think that this is the first time or last time people are going to talk about this stuff. Um, the future that we're headed towards and, and probably the present is data driven until it's not. And I really don't know how this is going to play out and, and how humans are going to fit into all this. Um, we'll, we'll have to see. I want to remind everybody we've got some more sessions today, um, including that sing along. There's a sing along. And, uh, and there's a bunch up coming up tomorrow. So on behalf of the, data, the team at the Data Economics Company, my name is Rob McGray and I'm signing off. This has been Digital Empathy, the story of data, narrative, and engagement. Thank you. <laughs>